today, Bob Fisher. One of the things I like about his ministry, you know, the new covenant is a precious covenant that we all are privileged to and are blessed by the new covenant of what Christ has done for us. But when you have someone who can explain and who can open up the foreshadowing in the old covenant, foreshadowing the new covenant, it just makes it all come alive and makes it so much more exciting and so real. And Bob just really has a, an ability and God has anointed him to do that, to really bring the understanding of the new covenant from the foreshadowing of the old covenant. And you're going to be blessed all day today, this morning, seven, uh, six o'clock tonight. Yes, yeah, six o'clock tonight. And please stay for our meal. There's plenty of food for everyone. And we'll, we'll, have, we'll have our feet under the table, fellowship with one another. And that's, that's kind of a New Testament thing where they gather together, put their feet under the table and shared time and meal sharing together. We're going to do that New Testament thing right down in our fellowship hall after the service this morning. Tell someone when you go home today to come back tonight at 6 o'clock. And uh, we're so glad. Hope, we're so glad you're here this morning. Hope is one of our new folks coming on Wednesday night. She was able to come today. So glad the Lord brought her here. Uh, Bob, let God speak through us, through you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hi, everyone. A little weak, but uh, we'll go with it. <laughs> nope, one chance. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know that. I know that. Pastor forgot to introduce my wife this year. She's easily offended. <laughs> and uh, so she's probably never, ever coming back to <laughs> here again. I'll tell you that right now. But uh, Judy, stand up. She's been here before, but this is my wife, Judy, my first wife. She's able to travel with me this week. But uh, it's always good to be here. Uh, we always look forward to coming and being with you. You're all so kind uh, to us, and, and, and especially to have a dinner. <laughs> you, you understand me, you know, that that's really what it's all about to me. <laughs> you know? Let's get the service over and let's eat. You know, it's like... <laughs> But uh, uh, it is wonderful to be here. Thank you for this uh, great opportunity to be with you. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. I want to, um, I'm not going to read uh, all of it, but I want to look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4 through chapter 6. It's a, um, uh, this picture of, uh, that God paints to us of this uh, uh, really foreshadowing of, of, of Christ uh, to come. Um, most of you are familiar with this passage. Let me just start reading. I'll just read a few verses, then I'm going to chat about it a little bit. The Philistines captured the ark, it said. Now the, now the Israelites went out to fight the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Apex. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and the battle spread. Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring up the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Let me just stop reading there. Most of you are familiar with this passage. It takes place during a time when Israel did not have a king. Uh, Eli was the priest of Israel. Eli, by this time, was, a, was an elderly man, a, a very large man. You're not allowed to say a fat man anymore. He's a large man, healthy man. And uh, the problem with Eli was he had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, his two sons who were priests of Israel as well, but they were ungodly men. They were, uh, they were vulgar men. They were men that would steal from people as they came to bring their sacrifices to the temple of the Lord. They would uh, uh, molest many of the women that would come to worship God at the temple. They were, they were ungodly. They were perverted. And Eli, the prophet of God, the priest of God, understood that. He knew that, but he never did anything to put them in check. He never Never did anything to stop them. He would say to them, yo, this is not good what you're doing. All Israel knows about this, but he never did anything 
uh, to stop it. In fact, later on, when God, God declares judgment over him, as he says, because you honored your sons over me. You, you allow them to corrupt the worship of God rather than uh, go for my honor. And it's during this time that God prophesied through Samuel, who was just a boy at the time, that, the, that God was going to, to destroy the two sons of Israel. They were both going to die on the same day. The passage that we read, the, the continuing fight between the Philistines and the, and the Israelites, constant battle that went on uh, between the flesh and the spirit, this constant battle that was going on. And at this occasion, Israel goes out to fight against the Philistines and, and are roundly defeated. 4,000 are killed. And Israel comes back and, and the elders of Israel cry out, why did this happen to us? It's like you hear so much in the church today. Why did this happen to us? We're king's kids. Nothing bad is ever supposed to happen to us. You know, we're, everything is supposed to be good all the time. And we find that that's not always the case. But then Israel said, look this, we've, we've been defeated. 4,000 have died. Why did, why did God allow this to happen to us? And then they came up with an idea. They said, wait a minute. We have a secret weapon. We've got God in a box. We can't lose. So they thought, we'll just go and bring up the Ark of the Presence. The Ark to Israel was a symbol of the very presence of Almighty God. It was a place where God's presence dwelt. When, when the Ark was present, God was present. When the Ark was present, there was, there was dignity, there was honor, there was hope, there was a future. And they had the Ark and they thought, well, if we just bring the Ark up, then we can't lose. You know, there you can't you can't lose. I remember I remember back when, growing up in, in New Jersey. You get a radio uh, station, and there was a there was a preacher who used to preach, and one of his key one of his key phrases was, "You can't lose with the stuff I use." <laughs> I always remember that. I don't why I have no idea what it meant, but it's good. <laughs> and that's the way they thought. You can't lose. You know, we got the ark. We can't be defeated because God cannot be defeated. And they go out to battle again against the Israelites or against the the. Uh, Philistines. Only this time they suffer an even greater defeat. It says in verse 10, so the Philistines fought against the Israelites and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers and the ark of God was captured. Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were, were dead. Here's the report that comes in. They go out to battle. They come back. Eli is waiting. He's, he's now an elderly man. He's, he's, he's blind, and, and he's waiting at the entrance of the city for the, for the people that come back to give him a report of what the battle is. And they tell him four things, and, and it, it, it goes from bad to worse. They said to him, the, the armies of Israel have fled. There was a great slaughter among the people. And they said, the Ark of the Covenant, or your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, have, have died. And the Ark of the Covenant has been captured. And it says that when Eli heard that the Ark of God had been captured, he fell over backwards, broke his neck, and died. Immediately, Phineas, uh, Eli's daughter-in-law, the, the wife of, uh, of his son, goes into labor. She's giving birth and gives birth to a son and dies in childbirth. One of the things that you see in Hebrew, the, the importance of a manner is, is uh, emphasized by repetition. And so four times over, or a number of times over and over in this script, in this passage, we read the same phrase, the ark of God had been captured. The ark of God had been captured. It was the vital thing. The, the Israelites had been, been slaughtered at. The 30,000 were killed. That was bad. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, have died. That was bad. All Israel has scattered. That's bad. But when he heard that the ark of God, the presence of God, had been captured by the enemy, he fell over backwards dead. It was a terrible, terrible thing. They thought, what happened here? 
God's honor is at stake and yet God has been, if you will, has been captured by the enemy. There, you know, we, so we, we've got God in the box and now everything has gone wrong. There's an awful lot, of, awful lot of the church people today that feel like we've got God in a box. If we do everything that we're supposed to do, then God has to come through to us. If we pray enough, if we give enough, if we fast enough, if we have our devotions regularly, if we do all things, then God is required to respond to us. If we pray the right kind of prayer, if we say the right words over somebody, then God is required to move. And what we find is that God is not in a box. It's interesting how many times Jesus healed people and how many different ways he did it. Sometimes he spit in, in clay and made, made mud and put it in their eyes. Sometimes he laid his hand on them. Sometimes he just spoke a word. Sometimes he came near to them. Sometimes he just spoke a word in, in a distance. He healed in many various different ways because God doesn't want us to, real, to think that we have God in a box that he always has to move the same way and do the same things that he always does in the way that he's always done that. Throughout scripture you see God doing it's the same thing, but using different methods, different ways. Israel is defeated. Sometimes we forget that we serve a God who is so sovereign, so mysterious, so adventurous and free that he shows up in different ways. And if we're not careful, sometimes we'll miss him. It turns out that God can't be manipulated. That God is not in a box. He moves in unusual events, in unexpected ways and in different channels. The question is for us, is Jesus enough for us? Is Jesus enough for us even if we don't get the job that we were hoping for? Is Jesus enough even if we don't get the promotion? Is Jesus is enough even if we don't get that thing that we have been longing for? Is it enough just to know him and just to have him? Even if we don't win the battles, get the job, find a promotion, is Jesus enough for us? Israel goes into battle and they lose 30,000 people. Israel has, has fled before the, 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 the uh, Philistines. And I mentioned that repetition in, in Hebrew is a, is a form of, of, of giving emphasis to it. And so we see this phrase, the ark of God has been captured. We see it repeated over and over again. It's repeated in verse 11. It's repeated again in verse 17. Again in verse 18 and 19. And then again in verse 21 and verse 22. Eli's daughter-in-law gives the full impact of this message as she dies giving birth to her child. And in, in her last moments of life, the, the handmaiden says, oh, don't worry, you, you, you've given birth to a son. Everything's going to go on. And she dismisses what, she said, what the handmaiden says, and she names her son Ichabod. Ich meaning no, Kabod meaning weightiness or glory or, or presence. He, she named him no more glory. Because she understood that, that from then on, that this child would grow up in the same depressive state that we're all in. That the glory of God is missing. That the glory of God has, has gone. The ark has been captured and she called his name. Ichabod, no more glory. The Shekinah glory of God has been removed. The ark of God has been captured. You see, to Israel, where, where the ark was, there was glory. There was weightiness. There was importance. There was hope. There was dignity. There was meaning. In Hebrew, no ark meant no presence of God any longer. No glory, no weightiness. To Eli's, to Eli's daughter-in-law, this is the condition of mankind for now on. And she named her son Ichabod so that every time, a, every time a, a, a young friend would call his name Ichabod, they would be reminded there's no more glory. There's no more presence. Listen, there are a lot of people in our society today that live in a land called Ichabod. Live in a place where there's no glory. There's no hope. There's no presence. What do you do when you've done everything you know to do and you still don't get the answer? You still lose. What do you do when it seems like God is absent? When you find out that your name is Ichabod. 
you lose your job and you can't get another and it seems like you know, there's fear for loss of a health, your, 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 your home, your family. Worst of all, you cry out to God, but there's no answer. Heaven seems to be at brass. Your heart is filled with fear and, 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 and frustration and discouragement and disillusionment. And you call. There doesn't seem to be any hope. You want peace and you cry out to God for, for help, but there's, but there's no answer. You cry, God, where are you when I need you? And find out that everything has turned about, that your name has somehow become Ichabod. That the glory of God is no longer present. What do you do when it seems like your name is Ichabod? The fact is, there's no simple message. There's no simple answer. Unfortunately, there's no quick formulas. We don't have God in a box. To Israel, at this stage, their job was just to hold on. Just to wait and to watch and to trust and to remember to lay hold on God and to not give up, to trust Him. To be still, the Bible says, and know that He is God. To never doubt in the darkness what God has revealed in the light. For now, the whole story changes. For now, God is God's time. Now, it's not so much what we do. It's what He's done. And what he's going to do. And what God does next in our story is unthinkable. It's stunning. It's shocking. The God of all the universe, if you will, allows himself to be captured by the enemy. He allows the ark of God, the manifest presence of God on the earth to be taken by the Philistines. He allows himself to be taken, Kevin, to the manifest presence of God put on a cart to be paraded down the streets of Ashdod to the shouting Philistines, to be mocked and taunted, to be dragged through the streets as the crowd say, he can't save Israel, he can't even save himself. And this God allows it. He allows himself to be captured, to be humiliated, to be mocked. The Holy One of Israel, unlike any God of the universe, takes on himself the suffering and the shame and the pain and the humiliation of his own people. What kind of God would do that? What kind of God would manifest himself in weakness? Humility and shame would identify with his people in their suffering. Isaiah 53 tells us something about that God. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. What kind of a God would allow himself, allow our iniquity to fall upon him? First Samuel 1 Samuel uh, chapters 4 through 6 tells us something about this God. To Israel, it was a picture of a day yet to come. But to us, it's a day that we recognize has come. When God would be present upon the earth once again. This time not in a box, but in a man. In a person. First, uh, John tells us in John chapter 1 verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his kabod. We beheld his glory. We saw the glory return. The glory of God came. It didn't look like we thought it would look. No wealth, no power, no authority. And at the end of a relatively short life, he's arrested. His body, the representation of the presence of God on earth, if you will, the new ark, is captured, paraded down the streets of Jerusalem to the mocking crowds who taunted him and, and spit upon him and, and laughed at him and said he, he saved others, but he can't even save himself. And God on earth became Ichabod. No more glory. He takes on our guilt, our desperate cry, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why has my name become Ichabod? And all the weight of our sin and suffering and forsakenness is born on Jesus on the cross. And then we see his body the living, manifest presence of God on the earth, placed in the tomb, 
and the guards placed in front of it. Pilate must have said something like, I don't know a lot about this Jesus, but I sure have made a nice little box for him. But what Pilate doesn't know, and what mankind continually is surprised by, is that we serve a God who cannot be caged. We serve a God who cannot be put in a box. And we will see on the third day that he, God, sets himself free. And what God does at night when no one else is looking, when no one else is seen, God's glory, his kabod is revealed. Psalm 30 says, tears may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. The ark is taken, taken by the Philistines down into and, and taken into the city of Ashdod and, and put in the temple of Dagon, the great Philistine fish god. And all the Philistines go out that night and they party and they celebrate and they dance and they drink. And they say, we, he, our God has defeated our fish god, Dagon, has defeated the God of Israel. It appears that, that they have triumphed over God. They party and they da dance and they dance the night away. And finally, when it's late, they go and they shut the flaps on the temple, uh, or on the tent of, of the great fish god, Dagon. They turn out the, the lanterns and they go to their homes and, they, and their tents and they, they sleep for the night and they get up in the morning. And they go to Dagon's temple to open up the, the flaps. And, and there was Dagon falling on his face before the ark of God. They thought, this is not good. <laughs> this is not a good advertisement for our God. <laughs> and it says they go over and they prop up Dagon. You know, God help us if we serve a God that needs us to prop him up. <laughs> God help us if we serve a God that needs us to fight his battles. <laughs> We serve a God that doesn't ask us to give up our sons for him. He's a God that gave up his son for us. They go back, they prop up Dagon, and they go out, and they, they party, and they celebrate all day that Dagon has triumphed over the, the God of Israel. They drink, and they party, and they dance, and then finally at night, they go in to turn off the lanterns in the tent, in the tent and shut the flaps. And if Dagon was anything more than a stump of wood or a, a piece of stone, if he really was something, he probably would have said something like, whoa, wait a minute, don't leave me in here alone. You don't know what goes on here at night. <laughs> they come back the next morning, and there was Dagon, falling on his face again before the ark. Only this time, his arms and his hands are broken off, or his, and head are broken off, and are taken over to the, the entrance to the temple and laid at the threshold of the entrance of the temple. I don't know what happened. Only God knows and only God sees. All I know is that it's a three-day story. The first day is very dark. It looks like God is defeated, that the glory is gone, that the hope has been, been lost. Heaven is silent. There's no more glory. It's Ichabod. And there are many people that live in a day like this. Some of you may be going through a day like this when you're questioning, God, what has happened? Where were you in the midst of all of this? Some days are like that. Some days are, are dark and they seem hopeless and we have no answers. There's suffering and there's sorrow. And there's heartache and heartbreak. There's discouragement. It's the dark night of the soul when everything seems hopeless. There are days like that. The second day is a day of hidden combat. God on the move. War in the heavenly realm. Spiritual warfare. The unseen clash between God and the forces of darkness. A day of uncertainty and anxiety, but a day of work. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> A day of God working behind the scenes. A day to hold on and cling to everything that we know about God. When everything seems to, to be contra contradicting, we hold on. God, I know who you are. I know that you're faithful. When it seems like everything is hopeless, when it seems like things have gotten out of control,
control. God, you are still in control. You're in control of my home. You're in control of my life. You're in control of my health. You're in control of my family. God, I put my trust in you. It doesn't look good, but God, you look good, and you are my hope. We just stand, and we hold on. We trust in him. We hold on to everything that we know about God. Some days are like that. I have a, a friend, Pastor Dave and Joan have met them. Uh, I think, uh, uh, I don't know. But anyway, they're pastor in, in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And about a month and a half ago, six weeks ago, he put a message on Facebook, Facebook to all of us that his wife was, had gotten double pneumonia, terrible infections in her, in her lungs. She's on life support, and they don't know she's going to make it through the weekend. There was no hope. She was unconscious for, for, weeks, for a week or more on oxygen and, and on life support. And every day he would give us a report. We still believe God. We still trust God. We're still holding on. When everything seems hopeless, when everything seems dark, we just hold on to what we know about Him. We know that He's faithful. Even when we have be, they remain unfaithful, He remains faithful. And He's just held on to I saw last night in it, His it text that, she, that she's being discharged from the hospital uh, Monday. So April, April 1st, He said, this is no April Fool's Day. That we're being to, she, you know, she, she's doing rehab have. She's doing well. God has been faithful. We hold on. We trust Him even when it seems like there's hope. Even when there's no signs that things are getting better. How many times have you prayed for family members? It seems like their lives have just been destroyed and they're all out and you hold on. It doesn't seem to be any hope, any signs of hope, any progress. All we do is hold on to what we know about Him. Hold on to what we know about our God, that He's faithful. There are days that we hold on. There are days that we just trust in what we know Him. We don't doubt in the darkness what God has revealed in the light because then we come to the third day <laughs> the third day is God's day God does some of his best work at night when no one is around when no one sees and on the third day all the powers of darkness that opposed us are destroyed and are defeated. Idols are disarmed and stones are rolled away and God's people are filled with wonder and awe once again. All of a sudden the testimony of the Lord becomes a prophetic word in our lives. What God has done in the past is a prophecy and a testimony of what he will do today in your life and what he will do tomorrow in your life. Third day is a day of hope. It's a day of victory. It's a day of new beginnings. There's a, this is a three day story. And the third day belongs to God. God is on the march and cannot be stopped. We are the people of the third day. I was, I was, looking, at, I was looking at that sign, because that's what, right next to the, the words of the song. So I was looking at that sign all morning while we were singing. The, we're people of the resurrection. We're people of the third day. When he rose, we rose with him. And, and victory has become our portion. We're not people that go down. We're people that go through. He's a, he's a God of victory. Jesus sanctified the third day and said, this, this is the day of salvation. Today is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. We are people that no longer live and occupy the second and the first day. We're people that live in the third day. We may pass through those first two days, but we are people who reside in a day of victory, in a day of resurrection, in a day of hope, in a day of, of a new future and a new, a new sunrise. We're people of God. We never open up our doors towards the west, our windows towards the west, towards the setting sun. We open up our windows towards the east. It's a new day. It's a new sunrise. This is the best day of our lives. God is in control. God is doing something today in our hearts and our lives. Even if we don't see it, God knows where we're at. And God knows what's going on in our hearts. Oh, I wish I, let me, I, I should stop. I'm getting hungry. Oh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me go on. You're just a little bit. 
in, in chapter 5, in chapter 5, the, Israel, the, the Philistines still have the ark of God. They're, they're, they, they, they're, they're, they're suffering. It says that God struck them with, with tumors, all the Philistines with tumors. Now, what you've got to realize, the Philistines were like the Cleons on Star Trek. You know, there's nothing greater than to die in battle. You know, come rip our arms off, beat us over the head with them. You know, we love it. You know, we don't die in battle. We don't get killed and run through with swords and stop going. We love it. And God could have come in and just wiped them out. But instead, God strikes them with with tumor. Now, I probably shouldn't share this on a Sunday morning, but actually the Hebrew word for tumor could also be translated as as hemorrhoids. God struck them with hemorrhoids. I think only God would think about that. Come on! Yeah! Oh! What's wrong? Have a seat. No. And then they were really what they were... They were dangerous ones. They were ones that kill you. These were really bad. They were suffering. I mean, that's typical, right? You know, right me through with a sword. Oh. <laughs> and she struck them with, with hemorrhoids. And they figure, you know, maybe, you know, it's the, it's the judgment of God, the God, uh, God of the ark. We, we, need to, we need to get rid of it. And so they're in, they're in Sanford. And they said, you know, let's take the ark out. And, and ship it over to our brothers and sisters in, in where do we live? Where do you live? Southern Pines. Let's ship it over to our brothers in Southern Pines and just see. Maybe it's just a coincidence. And so they ship it over to Southern Pines. And everybody in Southern Pines get, whoa! <laughs> they get struck with the judgment. And they think, people in Southern Pines say, Look, let's get this out of here. Let's send it to Rockville. Rockville? Let's, Rockingham. Let's send it to Rockingham. Rockingham, they're not stupid. They go, no way! <laughs> Don't send that here. And so they got together. The priests get together. The priests of, of the Philistines get together and said, well, let's, you know, we got an idea. Let's, maybe, it's, maybe it's the judgment of God or maybe it's just happenstance. So here's what we do. We take the Ark of the Covenant and we put it on a new cart. And we take two cows that have just given birth. And we hitch them to the cart, and, we do, and then we take their calves that have just been born, and we put them off to the side of the road in a little, in a little, uh, who, who do what eat? <laughs> you tell, I grew up on a farm, farmer's market, and uh, a fence, <laughs> a corral, I don't know if you put the cows in corrals or whatever, but anyway, in a little confined area. And then we'll, we'll send the ark back to Israel. And if the cows, the mother cows ignore their maternal instinct. And instead, when they hear their calves lowing, go turn off the road and, and go over to their calves. If, if they ignore that and they go, they go straight up to Israel, we'll know this was God. If they turn away and go back to their calves, we'll know that it was just happenstance. We just got to deal with it. But then the priest said, we, we can't send it away empty. We need to send a gift to the God of of Israel. And so they they made five gold rats. One for each of the five kings of the Philistines. They made these gold rats. 